Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to discuss is the protein kinase C pathway. Okay, so we're going to discuss how you can activate the protein kinase enzyme that is protein kinase C. But as we'll see towards the end, there is not just one protein kinase C enzyme. There are many different protein kinase C enzymes. And by the way, protein kinase C is often abbreviated to PKC. P for protein, K for kinase, and then C for C. Okay, so the protein kinase C, and then we need pathway. Okay, right. So this pathway begins with a G protein coupled receptor. Now I'm not going to give you a, a specific G protein coupled receptor that we're working with because there are many, many examples of G protein coupled receptors which can activate the protein kinase C pathway. Okay, so we're going to start off with a general G protein coupled receptor. Okay, and for short, G protein coupled receptors are usually abbreviated to GPCRs. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves of what a GPCR looks like. So if this represents the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane, so we've got two layers of phospholipids, the outer leaflet, uh, which is the layer that faces the extracellular fluid, and the inner leaflet, which is the layer of phospholipids which faces the uh, cytoplasm. Okay, and all G protein coupled receptors have a characteristic structure. Okay, so they all have their amino termini extracellularly, and then if this line represents the polymer of amino acids, what happens is it spans the membrane once in a membrane spanning alpha helix, then it does it again, then for a third time, then for a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, and a seventh time. Okay, so you end up with these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, like so. And then the carboxylic acid tail of the polypeptide will be on the cytoplasmic side. Okay, so let's just discuss a little bit of nomenclature with regards to G-protein coupled receptors. So, firstly, we'll discuss the naming of the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices that I'm now highlighting in blue here. Okay, so the first one, the one that's closest to the amino terminus over here, is known as the transmembrane domain 1, or TM1 for short. The second one after that is known as TM2. The third one is known as TM3. The fourth one is TM4. The fifth one is TM5. The sixth one is TM6. And then the final one, the seventh one, is called TM7. So I don't want to have to write out TM1 all the way through to TM7, so I've just uh, written out the first and the last. Okay, right. Some more nomenclature. These loops that we have in between the transmembrane domains, we have three of them on the intracellular aspects. We have this first one here in between transmembrane domain 1 and transmembrane domain 2. We have the second one here in between transmembrane domain 3 and transmembrane domain 4. And we have this one here in between transmembrane domain 5 and transmembrane domain 6. So these loops are known as the intracellular loops. Okay, intra means within, cellular means that they're inside the cell, okay, and then loops. And for short, the intracellular loops are abbreviated to the ICLs, okay, so this first one will be called ICL1, this second one will be called ICL2, this third one will be called ICL3. Okay, moving on, we then also have these extracellular loops out here which I'll cover color in, in turquoise here. These are called the extracellular loops, or for short, we have extra, sorry, ECL, okay? So E for extra, C for cellular, and then L for loop. So the first one is called ECL1, the second one ECL2, and the third one ECL3. Okay, right, so that's just a little bit of nomenclature for the different uh, portions of the GPCR structure. Okay, so let me give you some examples of GPCRs that are going to be relevant for activating the protein kinase C pathway. So some examples would be the H1 histamine receptor, the M1 or, and the M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, uh, what other examples can I come up with? The alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. There's more than one alpha-1 receptor. There's three of the things, uh, but all of those. Um, and you can come up with many other examples. Okay, so 
The thing that these all have in common is that these G protein coupled receptors, when their ligand binds to them, okay, so I'll draw the ligand coming in and binding to them, so in comes the ligand. When the ligand binds to them, what will happen is you'll get a conformational change in the G protein coupled receptor, which will be translated down to these intracellular loops, okay, and the intracellular loops will change conformation and they will now make available a binding site for the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein. And the alpha subunit which they bind to will be within the G alpha Q slash 11 family of alpha subunits, and I will explain exactly what that means, okay, because generally people have heard of G alpha Q, but not G alpha 11, so I'll explain to you what this means. Okay, so, to understand this, we need to have a little look at the heterotrimeric G proteins then. So once again, here is our phospholipid bi there, with our outer leaflet and our inner leaflet. Okay, and we now want to discuss heterotrimeric G proteins, which are the G proteins which G protein coupled receptors are going to interact with. Okay, right. So heterotrimeric means uh, different free membered structure, basically. Trimer means that you've got a structure which is built out of free subunits. Hetero means different, so it implies that the three different subunit, well, the three subunits are going to all be different, basically, and that's the case. Okay, so we'll start off with the main subunit, which is the alpha subunit. So I'll draw this here. So basically, the alpha subunit is the portion which actually is going to bind to a guanine nucleotide. And by the way, G here in G protein is short for guanine nucleotide binding protein. Okay, and this is because G proteins bind to guanine nucleotides. They bind to guanosine diphosphate and guanosine triphosphate. Okay, so here is our alpha subunit here. And basically, the alpha subunit can be in two states. It can be in an off state in which it has guanosine diphosphate, GDP, bound to it, okay? And it can also be in an on state where it has guanosine triphosphate, GTP, bound to it. Now, let's say initially our alpha subunit has guanosine diphosphate, GDP, bound to it, and therefore is in the off state. Okay, right, so let's colour in the alpha subunit here in red. Now, the next thing I need to discuss is that the alpha subunit is going to be attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bi there. It's not an integral membrane protein, it is within the cytoplasm, but it's attached to the bottom of the cell membrane, basically. It's attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bi there. Now, how does this work? Well, basically, the alpha subunits have a lipid structure attached onto them, okay? They have a lipid moiety, as it's called. Now, let me give you the examples of the lipid moieties that can be attached to alpha subunits. So usually what happens is the alpha subunit gets palmitoylated, meaning that it's going to get a palmitic acid molecule attached onto it. Now, palmitic acid is the old biochemist name for a molecule that would nowadays be called hexadecanoic acid. Okay, and although hexadecanoic acid is a bit more of a mouthful than palmitic acid, it's a useful name because it tells you exactly what we're dealing with here. It tells us that we're dealing with a 16 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, so here's the carboxylic acid group. That's one carbon. We now need another 16 car sorry, another 15 carbons to take us up to 16. And these all need to be fully saturated. Okay, so there's the carbon number one. Then we're going to have 14 carbons in the form of methylene groups. Okay, so here is a methylene group. And because I don't want to have to draw 14 methylene groups, what I'll do is draw one methylene group, put brackets around it like this, and then subscript it 14. That's a useful trick for saying, repeat this methylene group 14 times, basically. Then on the end of the 15th methylene group, or the 15th carbon, rather, uh, the 14th methylene group. You will then have a methyl group, okay? And that takes us up, I claim, to 16 carbons. We have one here, 
14 here, that's 15, and then this final one here, that's 16. So basically, these molecules can be attached onto the alpha subunit, and out, some certain alpha subunits will have one of these attached to them. Now, the other thing that can be attached to alpha subunits is meristic acid. So let me now discuss what meristic acid is. So meristic acid is again an old biochemist name for a molecule that would now be called tetradecanoic acid. Okay, and again tetradecanoic acid is the more useful name. It tells us that we're just dealing with a 14 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, so here's the carboxylic acid group. Uh, then we need 12 methylene groups this time because we don't want it to be four. Well, we don't want it to be 16 uh, carbons long, long this time. We want it to be 14 overall. So since there are going to be two on either side, one in the carboxylic acid group and one in the methyl group, we're going to need 12 in the middle in the form of methylene groups. Okay, and here then is the methyl group on the end. So this is the structure of meristic acid, which is also known as tetradecanoic acid. So what you're going to do, basically, is you're going to add one of these molecules onto the side of your alpha subunit, okay? And this will dangle off the side, and it's got an extremely long hydrophobic tail. And that extremely long hydrophobic tail implants into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and holds the alpha subunit at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so most alpha subunits get either a palmitic acid molecule added onto them or a meristic acid molecule added onto them. Some of them get both, basically. Okay, uh, so these lipid moieties, I'll only show one because most of them only do have one. A few of them have two. Okay, uh, these will hold the alpha subunit nicely at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Now, when the alpha subunit is in the off state, as it is at the moment with guanosine diphosphate bound to it, it can associate with two other subunits, okay? And the two other subunits are called beta and gamma subunits. And these two other subunits usually bind to one another and stay together all of the time. In fact, there's no physiological uh, circumstance known where they do come apart, okay? So let me show this now. So the alpha subunit is going to bind to this complex of a beta subunit bound to a gamma subunit. Okay, and because they hardly ever come apart, they are called the beta-gamma complex. Now, uh, basically the gamma um, subunit will have a lipid moiety attached to it just like the alpha subunit. It's not a simple group like these anymore. These are nice and simple. Palmitic and myristic acid are just simple carboxylic acids that we've attached onto the side. This is a more complicated lipid moiety here called a prenyl group. However, the principle is exactly the same, that what you've done is you've added a long hydrophobic molecule onto the side, which is then dangling into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and is holding our beta-gamma complex there. The beta subunit doesn't have a lipid moiety of its own, so that's a good reason for it to stay with the gamma moiety, because otherwise it wouldn't be attached to the uh, inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, right. So let's colour in the beta and the gamma subunits in different colours. So we'll have the beta subunit in blue here. Beta for blue. Okay, and then we'll have the gamma subunit in green. Okay, right. So, what will happen is when the alpha subunit is in the off state, when it has GDP bound to it rather than GTP, it can associate with a beta-gamma complex, and then they can form the entire heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, right. So, what I firstly want to discuss before going into the details of... Um, Actually, no, I think I will go into the details of what a G-alpha Q slash 11 is before I discuss the G-protein cycle. So in the next video, what we'll do is we'll discuss all the different types of heterotrimeric G-proteins, okay, all the different alpha subunits, all the different beta subunits, and all the different gamma subunits, and then we'll understand what is meant by saying that um, we are dealing with a heterotrimeric G-protein where the alpha subunit is in within the G-alpha-Q-11 family of alpha subunits.